our next session uh, talking about functions of several variables is going to be about limits and continuity. So again, to start off with a review, uh, think about what we understand about single variable functions. We know that limits in the plane, the idea here is that if you look at the graph posted on the left, does the limit at x0 exist? Does the limit as x approaches x0 exist for f of x, our function? Well, we say that it does uh, informally because the function approaches the limit of L, uh, that output that would kind of, you could imagine would be related as we were talking about inputs and outputs last time, this L output would be related to X zero if it were defined as an input to this, uh, to this function. I've got that hollow circle there to show that X zero is actually excluded from the domain of this sort of imaginary function F of X. Um, but it, it, the informal idea is that yes, it approaches it from both sides. And so is F continuous now? No, uh, it's gonna fail the continuity check at X zero or the continuity checks for, for a single variable. Well, does the limit exist? Yes, the limit exists just fine. Um, does, the limit, uh, does the limit agree with the actual output? So is the limit of F of X as X goes to X zero, the same as f of x0. In this case, it's not because our function is undefined at x0. So it's not said to be continuous. That's kind of the informal continuity checks there. So our function fails the continuity at uh, the input x0 because f of x0 is undefined. However, the limit is defined, but the limit does not agree with the function there. And I'm seeing a typo as, again, I apologize for these typos here on these slides, but there needs to be an f of x in that limit there. Okay, so what changes in higher dimensions? Well, now, instead of just being able to approach a limit from the left and the right, uh, we have to, a limiting value for our function, we have to consider, hey, um, I need to be able to approach this thing from, from many, many, many directions, not just from the left or the right. So here's an example, uh, that function we've seen before, uh, sine of x plus y. And we're now, our inputs are the x, y plane. So instead of just having x going to x zero, we're gonna have x comma y, uh, the points in the plane approaching the point one comma one. And so, well, how many different ways can we approach 1.1 on the plane? Well, the quick answer is an infinite number of ways. You could come at it from an infinite number of lines. You could come at it from a parabola. You could come at it from some kind of a cubic. Those are just the simple ones. There's lots and lots of different paths. But for illustration purposes, let's just approach this thing uh, along the paths of x equals one, y equals one, and y is equal to x. And those are plotted on the right there. You can see that, hey, uh, as I'm approaching one, one in the plane along these paths, the corresponding slices on the surface are shown and they all appear to kind of approach that same value. So here's the formal definition of a multivariable limit. So as usual, let z is equal to f of x, y be a function, then f of x, y approaches the limit, the limiting value l as x, y approaches x zero, y zero. If for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists some delta greater than zero such that for all x, y in the domain of f, uh, when we have that, the distance between f of x, y, our output, and the limiting value of l is less than epsilon, we have that uh, zero is less than the distance uh, in the plane to our input value of x0, y0 is less than delta. I've never been a huge fan of the formal definition of continuity here. Um, I think. So the intuitive concept, and, and actually what this truly means here is, if you imagine walking on the surface, approaching the limiting value from all possible paths, and they all approach that same limiting value, that's when we say that the limit exists. And the picture of the formal definition is kind of shown below. Uh, Okay, so let's move on to properties. Properties of limits. Just like for simple vari single variable calculus, limits are really nice to work with. And I, I recognize nice is a subjective word and you may disagree with me and you're welcome to do so. But limits are pretty great. If you think you should be able to do something with that, oftentimes you are able to do what you think you should. And I'll get into that in a little bit. 
So instead of writing out all the, the specific properties that we've we've seen before for limits and single variable calculus, I'm just going to say, see the limits, uh, the table and the text that lists out all the properties of multivariable limits. Um, again, the concepts are very similar to single variable calculus. And what I meant when I said uh, limits are very, very nice, um, for example here, I'm going to read the sentence here, the limit of a quotient of functions, okay, you see that limit on the left, the limit as x, y approaches x0, y0 of the quotient of f divided by g, two functions, is the quotient of the limit of those functions. So the quotient of the limit of those functions means that we now can take the, the limit of those two functions being divided and take the limit of the individual function on top divided by the limit of the individual function on the bottom. And informally saying you can break up limits over division and multiplication of functions, and you can break up limits across addition and subtraction. While not terribly formal words, uh, breaking up is an okay way to think about it. Uh, yeah, as always, you have to address the possibility of division by zero. Okay, so. Uh, how are we going to work with this? So to work with limits, uh, limits rather, in uh, multivariable calculus, you plug in the inputs you're approaching. If the math works, good, great, the limit exists. Uh, no, it doesn't? OK, well, just like in single variable calculus, we try some algebra to rewrite the expression to determine if we can algebra the expression into shape and, and determine whether the limit exists. Common strategies to do this are factoring and reducing, multiplying by some conjugate version of 1. Um, for instance, if you had x, whoops, I got to get these pens sorted out. x minus y over uh, 2x plus y, then multiplying with the conjugate version of 1 here would be taking this and thinking, OK, I want to deal with this problem child in the denominator. So I'll take it times the conjugate in the denominator. And this is really 1 because anything over itself is just 1. OK, so let's work some examples and look at things. Uh, so consider the limit as the inputs x, y approach the point 0, 1 of x minus x, y plus 3 all over x squared y plus 5x, y minus y to the third power. Well, again, following just what do you try first? Plug it in. See if it works. Plug it in 0, 4x. Yeah. Whoops. When I want a highlighter, I don't have a highlighter. When I want a pen, I have a highlighter. Whoops. All right, so just, yeah. Substituting in zero for all of our x values, and then substituting in y uh, equals one, sorry, for all of our y values. Doing the math on that, we get negative three. Great, good to go. Uh, we don't have any division by zero for that input. The limit exists. And if we looked at a graph of that function, we would notice that sure enough, above or below rather, as the case may be, the point, the input point, uh, 0, 1 in the xy plane, we'd have a related z value height, if you will, of negative 3. So in other words, the point 0, 1, negative 3 would be on this surface. Whoops, spoiler alert, this limit exists as well. So consider the limit as xy as xy approaches 3, negative 4 of the function square root of x squared plus y squared. Again, substituting in 3 for x and negative 4 in for y, you see that everything works out and our limit is just fine. It exists. OK, so now we're going to get some problem childs, if you will, things where things can go wrong. So now consider the limit as xy goes to 0, 0 of the function x squared minus y squared, all divided by the square root of x minus the square root of y is equal to uh oh, we got zero over zero. We got division by zero. That's a problem. What should we try? We'll try some algebra. In this case, this seems like the division by zero is the problem child. So let's uh let's try multiplying by the conjugate here. And what I mean by the conjugate is this has conjugate that. The conjugate of x root x minus root y is root x plus root y. And we've really just multiplying this expression on the left by a fancy version of 1. So we're not actually changing anything. We're just rewriting things. And on the bottom, as you uh, distribute that out, combine like terms, et cetera, et cetera, you get x minus y. And on the top, you get the slightly more complicated expression. Now, does this fix our problem immediately? No. We got to do a little more algebra to sort of see if we can go further. And so what we do is we look at this first expression. And we say, hey, if I, if I factor an x out, I get the same thing as the expression on the bottom. And so I see that when I do factor that x out, I can then, whoops, I can then go ahead and reduce these guys out as shown in the next line down below. And what do you end up with? You end up with a new expression, which is sort of equivalent 
to the original expression we started with. So our, our limit becomes, you know, do this math. And then when we try and evaluate the new version of our limit, we see that we get zero. So the limit exists in this case. So let's take a look at what's actually going on here by looking at the graph of this thing. All right, before we take a look at this graph, let's just take a moment to think back to the last um, section we were talking about and think, okay, what is the domain of this thing? Well, we can't have, what, can, what could go wrong? Well, a lot could go wrong here. Um, root x means we can't have any negative values of x. Root y means we can't have any negative values of y. And so just looking at the xy plane as our input plane, um, well, x and y are both negative down here. X is negative over here and Y is negative over here. So the only quadrant in which this function is defined is above kind of the first quadrant there where you have positive X and Y values. Um, what else could go wrong? We could also have division by zero. And so root X minus root Y is not allowed to be zero. It's the same thing as root X. It's not allowed to be root Y. And you know, with a little bit of hand waving, a little bit of informality here, that's basically equivalent to x is not allowed to be y. Okay, so where is x equal to y? That's going to be on this diagonal line here. Okay, so really the only place this thing is defined is where it's highlighted blue there above those input values, excluding the diagonal y is equal to x line. So now the reason I want to revisit that before we looked at the GeoGebra graph is, like I said before, GeoGebra is great, but sometimes it's not perfect. We're going to lose the fact that y is equal to x there is undefined in this graph if we look at this, because it sure looks like that is. But you will notice that if I drag this from the top view with the x and y axis as in the usual orientation we're used to, um, notice that this function is only defined above the quadrant one where x and y values are positive. Um, so yeah. So why is it okay to say that that limit exists? Well, we're gonna get a little bit more into this um, later in our discussion here of limits, but this the limit exists because where the function is defined, you can imagine approaching that surface, standing on it and kind of walking towards the input zero, zero point, you're gonna approach always that output of zero from any possible direction where this surface is defined. Okay, well, we'll come back to more examples, just more examples. Let's just plow forward and do more examples. Okay, so now our next example, the limit as x, y goes to zero, zero, noticing a theme here, zero, zero causes some problems because oftentimes it leads to, I don't know, things where zero division by. X uh, of the function four x, y squared over x squared plus y squared. Well, we're gonna have division by zero again. Uh, it's gonna be a zero over zero again. So, so now, Great, can we algebra this thing into shape? Well, well, I don't know about that. We might try, but I think we're gonna follow it down a road and I'm not really get anywhere. And so the conclusion we'd reach is that to do this limit, we'd need to apply the definition. And so instead of doing that, because I'm not gonna ask you guys to do that, let's just explore it informally. So what happens at the input zero, zero? Well, it appears the function is undefined because zero, zero is not in our domain. Okay, all right, that's fair. But we can still ask whether the limit exists. Remember that, that first example we had on the first page, just because a value is excluded from the domain doesn't mean the limit doesn't exist because that limit would exist uh, uh, as we approached x naught of the function f. So the limit appears to be zero because the function approached zero from all directions. Again, let's take a look at a graph. Let's see what we could speculate here and think. All right, so this one's gonna be, I don't know what this is. Let's see. Oh, yeah. All right. So here is the graph of this function. OK, the one we're talking about. So 0, 0 is undefined. Yep, there's a hole right there at the origin. We can't see it. The graph is going to, the graphing calculator, if you will, is going to fail us there. But informally, if I imagined walking on the surface from any direction towards the input point of 0, 0, or towards the origin 0, 0, 0, I sure am going to be approaching the output height of zero. And informally, it seems like that limit is defined. OK, so that last discussion was really meant to be an example of we can't always rely on graphs to determine whether a limit exists or not. So consider this limit. Um, 
the limit as xy goes to 0, 0 of y over x. Let's try to approach 0, 0 along two different paths. First, we're going to try approaching 0, 0 along the x-axis. And the xy plane inputs on the x-axis have y is equal to 0. So if we're traveling along the on the input plane along the x-axis, we're going to be traveling along points that have the form x comma 0, because the y value is 0 on the x-axis. So replacing that with um, where we're after here, we're going to say, OK, what happens here in this case? Well, the, as we walk along the x-axis, the x values change, but the y value is always going to be the same. And so this problem becomes uh, 0 over x is equal to 0. So along uh, we have for this limit 0 along the points on this path along the x-axis. All right, so now uh, for our second path, let's consider trying to approach this limit along the y equals x line. So every point on the y is equal to x line has point of the form x comma x, because x, y, if y is equal to x, then you can replace y with just x. So uh, as x, y approaches x, x, you know, I, 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 you probably heard me pause on this last one, and that's because I've written this wrong, so let's fix it. Okay, so it shouldn't be that way. It should be x, y is now being replaced with x, 0, and we're approaching 0, comma, 0. Okay, so now we've got the y value equal to 0 here, x, comma, 0. Before we do the limit, we're going to make this substitution here. We're going to, what color haven't I used? Orange. We say, okay, well, y is equal to 0, so let's just go ahead and replace y with 0 and see what we get. And so more accurately, between before this uh, equal sign, I really should have a second step here that says the limit as x comma 0 goes to 0 comma 0. We have, so this thing comes down here and is equal to this thing. Uh, my equal sign got in the way there. And now we're going to put that 0 in for y. We're going to get 0 over x. And then we're going to simplify that. We're going to say, OK, now our limit becomes x comma 0 approaches 0 comma 0. Well, the, the expression we're looking for, 0 divided by anything up until you get to 0 is going to be 0. So we'd simplify that expression and say, OK, now our limit does, in fact, equal 0. That's a little better. So similarly here, let's fix that before we talk about this. The points of x, y form, when we're traveling along the y is equal to x line, is going to be x comma x, and we're approaching 0 comma 0. OK, so now if all of your points are going to be of the form x comma x, we're going to go ahead and replace that y value in our original limit there with x. x, x simplifies down to 1. So really, this whole expression, before we take the limit, algebra is down to 1. And so the limit as x, x goes to 0, 0 of a constant 1, well, the limit of a constant number, as we know from COP1, is just that constant number. So we got 1. Oh, sorry, flipping around here. Why shouldn't be? OK, so let's try another path. Let's approach along the y-axis. Along the y-axis, points are going to have the form. This typo just continued through all the way. So I'll fix that with a set of arrows there. Ports are going to be of the form 0, comma y goes to 0, 0. So now dealing with this, this expression becomes uh, y over 0. So this becomes y over 0. There really should be a limit as uh, 0, comma y goes to 0, comma 0. And there, and then we would have y over 0. And now from calc 1, as we take a look and say, OK, the y value goes to 0 uh, before, sorry, wait, before we do that, what is anything divided by 0? going to approach. Well, anything divided by approach, 0 infinitely runs off to infinity like that. So now the point of this is along three different paths, we got three different limiting values. So that doesn't seem very good. Well, so let's, let's kind of explore what's going on here. 
So we're getting very different limiting values along different paths. So let's take a look at a graph and see what's happened here. Let's see if I've got that graph open. Sure enough. Well, I'm going to pause this and see if that, that link takes us to a more interesting graph. Yep, that link's a little bit better, so let's have a look at it. Forgot I had made this one. OK, so what do we have here? We've got the graph. Um, this page shows us, that, OK, the graph of z is equal to y over x looks something like this. I'm asking my little tablet to do a lot, and it's kind of angry at me. Looks something like this sort of weird little surface going on. But what's going on as we approach 0, 0 as an input? Well, if you look at that, I mean, well, if you look at it from here, it looks kind of like we're going to zero. But then if you look at it from here, there's something strange. It looks like the, well, it sort of looks like if you uh, are thinking about things being above, so-called above the Z axis, it looks like for zero, zero, the input zero, zero, it looks like we've got a whole bunch of different outputs. And that's not actually what's happening. That's just what it looks like here. So let's go ahead and uh, head over to that other graph and see what we got. So clear all drawings, get out of annotation mode, and switch over to this one. OK, and so now what I've done here is I've plotted that same surface, but I've approached it. I've approached 0, 0 uh, from different, uh, from different lines. So these black lines plotted in the x, y is equal to x plane are going to be the paths y is equal to negative 1, y is equal to x, and y is equal to 3x. And if you look at them, along those input paths, they relate to these output paths on the graph. But for each of them, for each of them, it sure looks like above zero, zero, if you will, or below zero, zero, we've got a different output. So along different paths, we're getting different outputs, uh, which is what it means to have one of the things that tells us that a limit does not exist, doesn't exist here for multivariable calculus. So let's head back to the slides. OK, so after we've looked at that, I've plotted uh, x, y approaching 0, 0 along a variety of lines, y is equal to m of x, and let the slope of that line vary, as we saw. And since we get different limiting values along each differing approach path, the limit doesn't exist. So to show a limit doesn't exist, it is enough. All you have to do, and that's not to say this is easy, but all you have to do is to show that we get two different limiting values along two different paths of approach in the domain. So that being said, instead of just picking two random paths and hoping that they don't, um, that they both go to different values, I like to kind of approach this as using uh, arbitrary paths of a certain type. And what I mean by that is, for our last example, we could have uh, done the limit by approaching along all possible lines of the form y is equal to m of x, m times x. Those are all lines that go through the origin and have a slope of m. And so as the limit would be approaching, we would have x be x and then y equal to m of x. So y is replaced with m of x. And we would do the algebra on that and see if that works out. So all that said, let's, uh, let's kind of look at an example. But before we look at an example, common sort of approaches to lines uh, or approaches, way to approach uh, inputs from various directions are to use. Uh, for the first example, all lines of slope m. Uh, for the second example, all parabolas uh, scaled by n or cubics scaled by p and lots and lots of things you could do if you wanted to get creative or somewhat silly. So to make this happen, pick at least two different paths of approach. If you're using a family of approaches, y equals m of x, for example, you're going to write, rewrite f of x, y in terms of f uh, of the path of approach. So it would be f of x comma m of x. For example, replacing all the y's with m of x, m times x. I'm saying m of x, sorry, m times x. Show that the function, and uh, once you've done that, show that the function has different limiting values along the different paths of approach. So let's see if we can work an example here. So revisiting our last example, uh, the limit as of the function y, is, y over x as xy goes to 0, 0. 
let's approach from all possible lines through the origin of the form y is equal to m of mx. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite our function uh, uh, using those input lines. And so f of x comma y equal to y over x becomes f of x comma m of x is equal to replacing that y with mx, mx over x, which reduces down to m quite nicely. And so our limit becomes just the limit uh, of this whole thing, these reduced away. So this, we're just taking the limit of some variables of a constant number m, and the limit of some variables that are unrelated to a constant is just that constant. So as we approach 0, 0 along any line of the form y is equal to mx, we get different limiting values, namely m, uh, which is to say that our limit doesn't exist. A different example. So the limit as xy approaches the origin of the function 2xy over x squared plus y squared. So this time we're going to again approach along all, uh, all lines of the form y is equal to mx. And so xy becomes x comma mx. And our function, when you replace y with mx, becomes, as you can see below, replacing y with mx, you get this second expression. And then we kind of algebra that together and simplify things. That x squared factor reduces away. And you're left with 2m over 1 plus m squared. That's just a constant, which is unrelated to x and y as x and y vary. And so our limit just becomes that constant value, 2m over 1 plus m squared. And so here is this example once it loads. OK. So as it's loading here for a second. We can kind of see, all right, what's happening here? Well, again, as we kind of wiggle this graph around and look at what happens as the inputs approach the origin, it looks like we kind of get this pinched up weird thing where it looks like you get uh, all of the values from one to negative one. But we know from a function, the definition of a function is that any input, even if it has multiple variables in it, of a real valued function can only have one output. So this looks like there's lots and lots of outputs there. So there's clearly something going on. And that something is that that point is excluded from the domain. And so very, very points, input points very near zero, zero, do some weird things. Okay, back to the slides and time for another example. All right, uh, so this time there's a slight difference. It's not the same example, it's a little different. I put a four there where there used to be a two. Okay, so now this time our choice of approach, I'm gonna use some parabolas. And this is largely because I experimented with it and tried lines that didn't work out. And so I tried instead of MX, I tried MX squared. Instead of M, I just called it K. There's nothing wrong with going M K or uh, MX squared, just using the same arbitrary constant. So when I rewrite the, uh, the function, in terms of approaching it along parabolas of the form y is equal to kx squared, I get this expression off here to the right. And when I algebra that expression off here to the right to all together, I factor out x um, to the fourth. And I notice that my denominator tidies up nicely and the numerator goes on. What have I done here? Okay, I've, I've made a typo. That's a, that's a fourth power there. That's not a second power. It does reduce away. and and we are left with just a constant value of 2k over 1 plus k squared. So as you approach um, along para parabolic paths, if you will, 0, 0 for this function, we get many, many very different values, which depending on the k in front of that parabola is going to be that output value. So let's have a look at what's happening with this particular graph. Not that one, but this one. Huh. Something even goofier. Uh, you got some weird going on there. Uh, again, zero, zero is excluded from the domain that would cause division by zero. And so input points nearby zero, zero uh, run off to infinity in various directions. But again, it's more complicated than just two variables because you can only run off in, to infinity in two directions. We can run off to infinity in lots and lots of strange directions. Okay. Okay, back to our slides. Uh, there's the link to that graph. OK, so that's kind of talking about limits. So let's talk about continuity. I kind of brushed over the uh, 
continuity check before, but let's put it out in a little more detail. So continuity in single variables, the informal check was three things. And the continuity in single variables is similar to continuity in multivariable functions. So f of x, y is uh, continuous at a point x0, y0, if these kind of three checks are made. Does the function defined at the point? Well, you can't be continuous at a point if that point is not in your domain. So all right, our functions defined at x0, y0. Uh, does the limit uh, as x, y approaches x, y, x0, y0, does it exist? Yeah, if it exists, that's a good sign. And the last thing to check is that the limit, the limiting value agrees with what the function is defined to be. So for an example of what could go wrong here in single variable calculus, sometimes a little easier to sort of build up with an intuition that we're used to. So say that's a graph of f of x. And here we've got f of x. Well, here the limit goes to L. So limit x goes to x naught of f equals L. But as I've drawn it, the open dots uh, shows us that x naught is not defined here. Well, let's just go ahead and define our function to be, I don't know, t. t is not a special letter. It's just the next k would have been a better choice or n or something. I chose t, whatever. OK, so now we know f of x 0 is defined to be t for this function. But here, our limiting value of L at x0, the function approaches x0, uh, L as we approach x0, rather, and our function is defined to be t. Those two values are different. So we do not have a continuous function here. That's why this third one matters, where you have to make sure that the limit agrees with what the function is actually defined to be at that point. And then that's what it means for a function to be continuous at an individual point. Uh, and so we say a function is continuous if it's continuous at every point in its domain. So careful there. If something's excluded for the domain, it doesn't matter. It's not in the domain, it doesn't matter. But every point in the domain, if it's continuous at every point, then it's said to be a continuous function. And again, the game is a little harder now in multivariable calculus because we can approach inputs from an infinite number of paths.